Uh, hello, I am moderator. I am from WWF Japan. My name is Tanaka. Thank you very much. And the, this is the Japan Climate Initiative. The, this is a continuous seminar, the third time, the coal and thermal power generation phase out challenge and the thinking from the policies of Japan and the UK. And decarbonization uh, moves are going forward, but the uh, one of the uh, factors in the coal and the thermal uh, power generations in POP26 documents last year, and also in G7 meeting we just had in the summit meeting in joint statement, and also talked about the reduction or phase out of the coal and thermal power generations. In 2024, it is only two years, the complete phase out uh, of the coal and thermal power generation is planned in the UK and then and then to make the decarbonizations and Japan is also uh, aiming at decarbonization of the power by the natural or renewable energy by 2035 so that they're using these uh, the mission that we like to uh, think about this topic in this program. Let me introduce about today's program now. So in the first, uh, this is a program. Uh, we have two presentations. First uh, is by Ms. Yuri Okubo uh, to talk about the situation in Japan. And then we have uh, Dr. Masu Webb uh, from the UK to present as a second speaker. And then the third one in the panel discussions in, in joining and also by CDP Worldwide Japan Associate Director Ms. Kai, uh, Taka, Tai Takase, and, and those uh, three people will have discussions. We will plan to conclude this seminar webinar by 5.30 Japanese Standard Time. In JCI website event page, you can see the documents uh, in that page. So please look at the event page to download the documents. And this archive the uh, video is also planned to be broadcasted in the later days, and we will notify you about that in e by using emails. And if you have questions, uh, please, in the right section in the Q&A sections of the webinar. And so, however, due to the time limitation, we may not be able to answer all the questions. So, and so for the questions, there's a quick Q&A icon box uh, icon uh, at the bottom of your screen, and then you can write your question in text. If you are using mobile uh, smartphones, uh, you can also, in a similar manner, to send the questions and Q&A box, and at any time you just come up with a question. And if you agree, and there's a function to agree to that, then let us, there's one question as a test trial on the left, and there's a, a thumb up button. And if you questions, if you also you want to have, ask the same question or similar questions, please uh, press this button as well. And that could be the uh, reference for us to choose which uh, question to be answered first. So now, we like to move on to the actual presentations from the Japanese coal and summer power generation policy, current status and challenges. Uh, Ms. Yuri Okubo, who is the uh, Renewable Energy Institute a senior researcher. So, oh, do you see my screen? Yes, we do. Thank you very much for the introduction, Tanaka-san. So I'll talk about the Japanese coal and thermal power generation policy in its current status and challenge. In June this year, uh, as Tanaka-san has also mentioned about the G7 summit uh, in the, by the, the summit declaration or agreement. In the decarbonization society, by 2035, power sector 
complete or significant decarbonization to be achieved. And the coal power generation is the one of the biggest contributor to the uh, global temperature rise. So that being recognized to, to accelerate the stepwise abolition and elimination of the coal and thermal power generation uh, in domestically. And that is in other than Japan and Italy, they have already achieved or they plan to achieve that uh, decarbonization by 20, 2035. So in case of Italy, they phase out, they would phase out, declare to by 2025. So in G6 countries, it is nothing new. However, for Japan, if it is taken seriously, energy basic plan had to be reviewed and that this conversion of, of the Japanese energy policy have to be revisited. So now let me talk about the current status of the uh, coal and thermal power generation in Japan. This is the global warming gas, about 85% to 90% are dominated uh, by this. Uh, uh, this is a graph we can see. And this is the uh, reference year was 1990, 1990. And in 2020, the CO2 carbon dioxide has been reduced by, uh, by uh, two, three, seven percent. However, in the blue portion in the top, this is the, in the power generation sector where the, since 1990, it has also increased about 10%, 11%, and 970 million ton was emitted due to the power generation. And more than half of the power generation comes from the coal, as in 55.1%, and then 230 million tons. In, and the 46% reduction was talked about by the government, by the, so the uh, crude oil, as well as the uh, coal and summer power generation. Uh, even if we do that, they will still not be able to achieve this goal. And if you look back in the power generations, uh, emissions of power generation is coming from the coal and summer power. And in 2020, from 1990, 4.2 times, and then share is more than 10% uh, to increase to 30% or more. Uh, in the summer power generation, this is a yellow color portion. In LNG is also increased. And in the emission, if you look at the emission uh, coefficient, and then the kilowatt hour, carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour is almost double. So, so that the uh, significant amount is produced from the coal and summer power generation. Next, in not the, uh, if you look at the coal and thermal power uh, facility equipment and capacity, that is, the, is compared to the uh, beginning time of 1950s, late 1950s, it increased about 1,500 uh, kilowatt, and then yellow portion and orange color portions, uh, inefficient, very old type power generation. Uh, uh, so about 80% of the total is by the power generation companies. And in the, if you look at this right hand side graph in 2016 to 2020, the coal, coal generation is about the 5 million kilowatt hour increase. And then in 2022 until 2030, another 5 million kilowatt uh, is planned to be increased. So that is the additional power generations is coming. There's no other country with coming coming from such a uh, coal power generations among the developed countries, Japan, and then Russia and Poland and Korea, and only a few countries are doing this today. And as you can see in the graph, in four, so it is operating more than 40 years, is the uh, 52 million megawatt also, and that is the uh, still operating even after 40 years. And the depreciations is that it should be taking only about 15 years, and then it is often uh, switched to the uh, newer equipment, the technologies, but still it has not been done. So this is the Japanese electricity mix in Japan in 2030 and 2050. Right now it is 30%. 
and almost around 20 percent comes from the coal thermal power plant. And further, this is refer reference, and towards 2050, ammonia coal firing or CCS, uh, adding that, uh, Japan assumes to move the power thermal plant. And if we do not create a new nuclear power plant, even if we extend what we have today, uh, 2050, at maximum, we have 10 percent or so. So most of them will be become measured by CCS. Therefore, even in 2050, there's going to be 30 percent at least. And currently, 40 percent of from the emission coming out from the coal thermal power plant. So we are going to be living in a total different world from the uh, European nations, West Western nations. And this is about uh, the six uh, energy pl basic plan in Japan. So here, uh, Japanese government is trying to fade out the non-efficient power thermal plant and to replace it into a decarbonized type of power thermal plant. In 2030, they have the target of having a coal firing of 20% ammonia, and then we'll be introducing the CCS commercialization in 2030. In 2030, in order to uh, fade out the non-efficient coal power plant, there are some measures from the Japanese government. Uh, there are several countermeasures already targeted. Uh, the ammonia, uh, whether it comes from the uh, non-fossil fuel or whether it be from the fossil fuel, uh, they do not question. Uh, furthermore, in order to maintain the high efficient uh, power thermal plant, Japan is going under through a act, a legislative act. And here, uh, the position of the uh, fossil fuel is included as uh, the non-fossil fuel energy, including hydrogen and ammonia. I will be looking in details, but ammonia is currently using, utilized as gas. Uh, therefore, uh, for the time being, we're going to be utilizing the fossil fuel derived ammonia. And we need to create a value chain in order to secure these materials. And Japan's government is to support in unity. Uh, further speaking, uh, from the METI, METI has a, a policy for the financing. Uh, they have the uh, transition roadmap created. And this roadmap within the financial institutions, uh, when the co companies are going to be making their finances, uh, the strategy of the decarbonization of the company, whether it be appropriate for the transition roadmap is going to be formalized and it's going to be assessed by the lender. Uh, this map, in assumption that uh, the 2015, uh, 2050, we're going to be having the commercialization of the facility. We have the image drawn, uh, the ammonia and hydrogen the coal firing is positioned around 2030 and then to uh, phase it down into zero near 2050, meaning that Japan is still going to be using a coal fire plant uh, for 2050, uh, but I'm not going into details. However, using uh, various technical development, uh, Japan is trying to weigh uh, the issue. And the other day there was a media report that there was announcement that uh, 77 billion yen worth of support is going to be added anew. So in this way, uh, Japan is now saying that this is a transition. However, uh, from the scientific perspective, the Paris Agreement 1.5 degrees target is not consistent with what the Japanese government is saying, and this needs caution. From here on, I would like to look into the challenges for Japan's coal-fired power policy. Uh, Japan's uh, policy, uh, there is a big challenge. The uh, pre-industrial level, uh, the 1.5 degrees Celsius target 
is what the Paris Agreement says, and that is a target and a scenario. However, the Japanese climate change policy does not draw on that policy. This is IEA's 2050 net zero scenario. In 2050, net zero. So in order to be net zero in 2050, we should immediately act, meaning that we should be suspend new coal-fired power plants without measure, without CCS, and Japanese government is stopping uh, the uh, support for the uh, coal-fired power plant anew overseas. However, uh, the coal power plant in Japan is still moving. And in 2030, other nations are saying that all coal-fired plants in developed countries shut down without CCS. And in 2035, achieve net zero power source. And 2050, 70% uh, of the world's power comes from solar and wind. And so that was what was agreed based on the scientific uh, understanding. In 2050, in order to become net zero, we need to have a preparation for the power section. They need to be decarbonized. And that understanding is expanding within the world. The reason why is that uh, the decarbonization of the power sector, when that is late, then all other industrial area, uh, for instance, transportation, even if EV is going to be rampant, uh, things will be in delay. Uh, those are the concerns of other nations. According to the IEA scenario, in 2030, uh, the measures that to be taken before 2030 should be taken within the power sector and the majority should be achieved within the coal power a thermal power plant and the message here is that it's the same same way with the ipcc's 1.5 degrees assessment report and we should start the move and this is the most top priority in order to be net zero in 2050 that's a message from the ic iea the Japanese government has been giving uh, the transition policy and uh, Japanese companies will be or and could be using the policy. However, they must understand that they are widely different from the other nations. This is another challenge for Japan. Uh, the emission for coal fire policy Japan is relying on future innovation, and the, the forecast is unclear when the technology is going to come. How is it going to be coming for 2050 to be carbon neutral? Uh, first of all, we must be reducing the uh, fossil fuel and the emission from the uh, power plant, but that is limited to the inefficient power plants. And IPCC these days are saying that it is important what we can do currently, and this is the decisive point in 2030 to 2050. The non-discontinuous innovation should be falling upon technology is what the Japanese government thinks. However, what happens when this scheduled innovation does not come? There is no uh, plan B for this. And for uh, the non-efficient, thermal power plant, the government does say that we are going to be phasing out. However, the, we can um, decrease uh, the dependency of the coal power plant to 30% or more. However, the pathway to reduce it to 10% uh, dependency is not drawn out yet. And third of all, the ammonia CCS if we're going to be changing into that, it's not about existing from the status quo. It's just an extension of what the Japanese government says. And here, as you say, as you can see, the dependent of uh, the fossil fuels compared to other nations, Japan has the most highest and uh, the self-sufficient rate is the most lowest, meaning that uh, the security for the nation itself is very low. And so changing into a raw material uh, that is coming from the external company, a uh, country, 
it is not going to be good. And also in the recent rise in the energy price, the gas price is also doubled and the thermal and power generation also increased greatly as well. So for five trillion yen is needed so that the coal price is quadrupled. So based on the worldwide situations, the prices of these energy may rise and such there's such a risk that we are facing. On the fourth issue or challenge is the ammonia power generation and CCS, those technology called challenge as well. Uh, the problems arise from that. The, there are many challenges that we have to overcome. And when the government uh, promotes this, there may be disadvantage and advantages and these oh, uh, pros and cons need to be assessed more sufficiently. The first one is there are some questionable technology in terms of environmental burden. The, by 2030, they say the 20-50% uh, mixed uh, installation have to become, but it may not become the level of LNG in terms of the, and also uh, ammonia is produced, manufactured using the nitrogen so that may also cause some natural uh, damage, nature damage, and that we have to consider such environmental aspect as well. This is the, uh, not the, this is just an image. It's not the precise calculation, but about 20% with the mixed installations and then mixed burning of the coal and ammonia, and 50% is on the right, second from the right. In the second uh, problem is that even if this is achieved, this is going to be an extremely high priced energy price. And the, according to the METI calculations, uh, they, the burn or the incinerate by 2050, then 23.5 yen per kilowatt hour uh, in the in exclusive uh, burning. But if in the targets by the METI is the seven yen per kilowatt hour by solar power generations and wind power generation is eight to nine yen per kilowatt hour. So therefore compared to even these uh, renewable energy, it is very high price by the ammonia power generation. And that is the nine yen versus this 23.5 yen. So the third point, the, we would need a large scale infrastructure investment in the infrastructure for the ammonia uh, power generations. And then 2.14 trillion Japanese yen is needed for the supply chain total business cost. And the, 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 uh, the turn, it, it may require the uh, 25 billion yen uh, for that. And also in the ammonia power generations, it may not be able to reduce the carbon dioxide extensively. So these assumptions is quite uh, paradoxical or may not even achieve that. And then according to the governments for the market, it may cause misunderstanding to the market. For example, in the emission uh, effect, the measure, all the uh, summer power generations, 20% ammonia mixed burning then they explain that the 400 million, uh, 40 million tons of carbon dioxide can be reduced. But if you look at the technical evaluations, the ammonia is the resource as a, a, a natural gas. CO2 is the uh, 1.6 ton carbon dioxide to be emitted to produce one ton of ammonia in the latest technology facility. So you know to produce that ammonia, the 32 million tons are actually produced. So only the reduction effect is only 8 million ton. And then they, uh, the, they say that 30 million tons by 2030. So that is the, what is required for this reduction. It is only can only do that is the perhaps the only reduction can they can we achieve is the 1.2 million ton. So this is a very high cost and very little a uh, small effect on the reduction of carbon dioxide. In terms of the uh, uh, to reduce the uh, by, uh, the government is keen on the CCS uh, to recover the carbon and to be uh, and that is the uh, by 
being able to do achieve commercialize this by 2030. But in CCS, the this is a lot of them are still under development, but there's no uh, commercial ones. Uh, uh, the uh, for the third core, and that is just only one. And the reason for that, in the technologically, it is very still unmature technology. Even if this is achieved, uh, it cannot make the complete uh, recovery of the carbon, and that is about ninety percent. But it is actually them is only 60% are, are recovered in actual operating uh, CCS. So that I've written that in my detailed report, but in because of the, in Japan, and that is the, uh, some limitation in terms of geographic area as well. So it's, it's planned to be transported overseas to do that. And this is according to the IPCC uh, report and CCS is the highest cost and the reduction potential is small. Then even if the cheapest is the uh, uh, power, wind power, uh, solar power and biomass power dimension. And this is the high power cost by CCS. So according in such situation, Japan is moving toward the decarbon uh, thermal power uh, the carbon, uh, the coals, and uh, they eliminate coals and, and some of other emissions in Kyoto city have first declared a participation in uh, going away from coal uh, alliances. And then this was a Friday for the future. And this is also requested from the group. And in Kyoto city, in the shareholder meeting this year, uh, to Kansai Electric Power Corporation. Uh, they have also a uh, shareholder uh, in the shareholder, uh, the shareholder proposal was made to the power companies in, in the Kansai. The NGOs uh, have also made such uh, proposals and that the uh, 20 in Japan, this is the first time overseas investors is asking for the uh, uh, shareholder proposal made to J Power. By this type of the institutional investors, and that is also done overseas as well. But this is now coming to Japan, so that the a lot of shareholder proposal was made to go away from no to the uh, to go away try to reduce the and go away from. There are 72 companies of RE100 participation companies, and as the universities, I would say 100% of eliminating coal and thermal power generations. Okay, the coal uh, derived ammonia, and those things are also need to be considered. <laughs> Lastly, in the coal and thermal power phase out, what is important is the one point. 1.5 degrees centigrade is viewed as the energy plan need to be made. And also uh, to make the, uh, the re reduction emission uh, uh, plan should be formulated. And then based on that, they can phase out the coal and thermal power generation. And then those who have worked in the power generations uh, need to work so that the bicarbon pricing need to be introduced to compensate for some of the funding uh, for the other transitional finance by phasing out earlier of the thermal, and power, uh, thermal power and coal power generations to compare it to the systems to, to improvement on power energy saving efficiency and without uh, reducing the quality of the uh, lives people's lives such as the installation and other improvement um, the use and recycles can be uh, become such an economy and also even if it pays out we need to have such a, a high ambition and high, set the high goals. Ammonia is often talked about is to reduce the emission, 
However, it is often said to, to, to adjust and coordinate the renewable energy, but the, we can do that rather than by thermal power. So lastly, so I think there will be non-power companies, but also demand side, consumer side need to make a uh, voice out that the decarbonization is delayed, then our future climate change is going to be a serious problem. And then also from individuals and companies and also municipal governments also being uh, local governments also be impacted. So therefore, we can think of really, really seriously about the transitions that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Okubo-san. Uh, based on a scientific base, uh, the coal power plant should be phased out, uh, which is important. Uh, but amidst that, uh, Japanese policy, even beyond 2030, uh, Japan is working on a technology that is still uh, emitting uh, the CO2. And so that was a policy of Japan introduced. And from here, we would like to call upon Dr. Matthew Webb, uh, and he is going to be sharing the presentation titled UK Journey to Phase Out Coal Power. Dr. Matthew Webb is from Deputy Director, COP26 Energy Transition Campaign Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy, UK Government. Please. There we go. Uh... Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, very clear. Fantastic. Uh, well, konnichiwa or uh, konbanwa, uh, greetings from the UK. Um, my name is, uh, is Matthew Webb. I am uh, a deputy director and I've been working on the COP26 energy transition campaign uh, as part of the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy for the UK government. Um, it, it's a great pleasure to join this session this morning. Um, I just wanted to first um, express deep concern over the news um, regarding Prime Minister Abe um, overnight, which has reached in the UK, and we are uh, expressing strong wishes that he recovers from what is a, a shocking incident. I just wanted to mention that before moving on to the presentation. Um, uh, I was hoping to talk a little bit today about the, uh, the, the progress that the UK has made over the last sort of 10 years um, to move away from coal-fired power generation and try and unpack some of the uh, measures and policies that the UK has taken to make that change. Um, and then think about some of the international work and international implications as well. Um, my slides to move. There we go. Um, the, UK, the UK has had a very long history uh, in coal, um, and it's been a long transition. And I guess this slide sort of illustrates the, the long transition that the UK has been making. Um, we had, uh, growing through the Industrial Revolution, uh, the UK peaked in terms of uh, coal mining employment in around 1913, where we had over a million miners employed. And UK consumption fell over the last century, um, partly as the use of coal was moved out of domestic uses um, in transport, and then eventually uh, began to be replaced by gas in power. Um, but actually, the UK was exposed to cheaper production of coal internationally, and that drove a structural change in the industry. That was almost the first cycle of the shift from coal, largely driven by economic reasons and the availability of other fossil fuel sources. Um, the UK's history in coal is marked geographically and socially across the country. Um, I always find this 
uh, picture striking uh, on the top left. This was some of the coal that was exported from South Wales. So not only was the UK a major user of coal itself, but also a major exporter and producer. Um, the picture on the right is my team visiting uh, what is still a uh, operational coal mine, but for tourists in, in South Wales. Um, the, the history of coal is also ingrained deeply socially. Uh, there are, you know, there are facets of coal mining that underpin uh, the, the trade union movement within the UK, um, which largely developed um, developing protections and standards in the coal mining sector. And obviously, uh, and quite famously, I suppose, in, in, in the 1980s, there were uh, there was quite a serious range of political disputes as the transition uh, took place um, and you know further job losses were made in the 1980s. Um, effectively in the UK, uh, in the middle of the last decade, around 2015, the last deep mine closed. Um, we still have a small but declining amount of open cast mining, um, which serves a rapidly reducing amount of uh, coal power station and also some 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 poking coal for steel manufacturer. Um, when we when we talk to other countries about coal, we're not we're not trying to preach or tell others what to do, but it's very we have a, a very interesting legacy effects that we think are very valuable to other countries if they want to come and look at how you manage the transition. We are still in transition. Um, this graph is quite interesting in that it shows that some of the industrial heartlands, which are in the centre of the UK, are still effectively catching up with the rest of the country. So the darker colours are higher GDP per capita, but actually the middle of the country where a lot of the industrial base, which was largely driven by coal, is still catching up. And that's something that we uh, are, are you know, happy to talk about countries come and visit us, they, they can look at some of the schemes that we put in place, some of the, the social nets that were put in place, the coal field regeneration schemes. And actually, the UK still has a, a strong levelling up agenda, which um, I'll come to in a minute, is, is about trying to make sure that all of the UK is growing at the same economic pace. Um, and actually, some of the growth in clean energy, which I'll come on to in a minute, is helping to uh, rejuvenate areas that were uh, previously sort of heavy coal manufacturing heartlands. I just picked a few recent stories that I thought were interesting to show the how the opportunity and the pace of the clean energy revolution is actually bringing jobs um, and prosperity to some of those regions that were previously heavy industrialized and, and reliant on coal. I just picked a couple of examples. Um, there's a place called Blythe in the northeast of England where uh, we we've, we we are now developing on the site of an old coal-fired power station. Um, there is both a, a new subsea cable manufacturing facility um, just been announced. Um, it's very close to the uh, the docking point of the, the the currently the longest undersea interconnector, which runs across to Norway, the Viking Link. Um, and there's also a new uh, gigavolt factory announced on that site. I also wanted to point to um, in Hull. Uh, further down the coast, um, we have uh, over the last few years developed a, a green port, which was actually developed on the site of an old coal export port at Alexandra Dock. Um, and that is now developing offshore wind turbines. And actually just, just yesterday, um, we announced that a 2.8 gigawatt offshore wind farm uh, was had licensing approval, which will make it, uh, at least for the moment, the world's largest offshore wind farm, but that facility has been serviced by uh, the, the Green Port, um, and it is a piece of our industrial heritage that has now been rejuvenated with green jobs. Um, and, an, and a very interesting final thing in, in this transition is we're now looking at heat from coal mines, uh, which is you know a challenge for the UK to decarbonise heat, but a, around a quarter of our homes and businesses are actually sat above abandoned coal mines where there is huge potential to tap into uh, waste 
wastewater heat and actually you can put heat in to recover it so there's a there's a really vibrant transition occurring now where new green renewable energy jobs are actually reinvigorating areas where there was previously coal mining and coal power um, in terms of policy progression i think it's it's clear to say that there has been a long-term vision and set direction by the UK government to make this transition. Um, on the left-hand side, um, the energy challenge is a white paper, energy white paper from 2003, which still had references to there being a need for new coal power generation. By 2008, uh, we had uh, put in place the legally binding Climate Change Act, which actually at that point set us to an 80% reduction in emissions by 2050, um, which then rapidly led to a uh, wholesale reform of the electricity market. And this is perhaps the most important point here. We had a climate target, we had a, a set of legally binding carbon budgets, but the reform of the energy sector was the critical, which allowed us to... Um, Within that electricity reform itself, um, there were a number of key stages. We put in place a firm carbon price, um, which was at that point above the European Emissions Trading Scheme. We put in place a mechanism to ensure security of supply. So we made sure we had sufficient firm capacity while we made the transition. And we also evolved a series of uh, firm incentives for renewable generation, um, which started as feed-in tariffs, then became fixed obligations, and now work as contracts for difference. So long-term uh, 15 or 25 year contracts with fixed, fixed returns for the renewable sector. At the same time, we also brought in new performance standards for new which essentially uh, fixed a limit of 450 grams per kilowatt hour. And we also made a commitment to phase coal in 2015. Um, all of these policies have been brought forward. And on, on the right, the, the, you know, the latest landmark policy is, the, is our strategy to hit net zero by 2050. Um, what has been really interesting in the UK is that this has led to a um, continued set of GDP growth. Um, so since 1990, the GDP in the UK has increased by around 72%. Um, the population has increased by about 15%. But actually, our total final energy consumption has, has reduced. Um, and this has also allowed us, this improvement of energy intensity emissions, um, energy intensity has allowed us to reduce our emissions. Um, and I think we are uh, performing at the top end of the G7 in terms of decoupling GDP growth from UK emissions. And digging into more detail, um, the effect of those policies, the firm uh, renewable incentives, uh, emissions reduction targets for generation and a commitment to phase out coal, over the last 10 years, total generation has declined by around 18%. Fossil fuel generation, fossil fuel uh, generation has gone down with 59%, and renewables have increased fivefold over, uh, over that period. So there's been a dramatic change in the uh, use of energy within the economy and a huge, a huge move towards renewable energy and away from, from coal. The proportion of gas hasn't changed very much, interestingly, in that we have. We have not built new gas-fired power stations in that time. We have utilised some of their capacity to support the development of renewables. But it's interesting we have not commissioned a new gas-powered power plant um, since, I think, 2014. So this hasn't been a flip to gas. This has been a shift to we've Im improved efficiency. There's been some restruct continued restructuring in the economy towards, towards services. So there has been a, 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 a factor there. But actually, the big shift here has been improved efficiency and a move towards renewable energy. Um, this just gives you some sort of statistics, uh, just, just to sort of 
cap that off. Uh, it, it, in 2012, we had about 40% of our generation was coming from coal-fired power. It's now down to 2% or less. And we have significant periods of time where we run without coal. Largely through the summer, we are not using coal-fired generation, except for um, occasional balancing services on the grid, which is a, an, an interesting challenge that the national grid is working very hard to, uh, to innovate. Um, synchronization, inertia, and system stability. But those problems um, should be resolved quite soon. And actually the national grid is a target, as it says here, to be able to run a zero emission, uh, zero emission 100% renewable grid by 2025, um, whereby it will be able to have fully stable operation, including for uh, factors such as inertia. Um, and we've announced we're gonna bring forward our phase out date to 2024. Um, we're affecting this by uh, bringing a 450 grams per kilowatt hour emissions limit into the capacity market. And, and it's the capacity market that has given some of the remaining coal generators some income over the last few years in the transition, but that will be coming to an end in 2024. Um, I just wanted to touch on uh, the, the effects, the implications of uh, the current uh, energy, I guess it's an energy crisis. We, if you listen to presentations from the IEA, they would say that this is the, unlike in the 1970s, this is the first time that we've had a price shock disruption to all three fossil fuels. Um, largely in the 70s, it was around oil, but actually prices of coal, prices of oil, prices of gas have all gone up to uh, extremely high levels. Um, and that's, that is stressing a number of economies who have dependency on fossil fuel. Um, as a response to that, the, the UK did publish a new energy security strategy in, in April, um, which sets out a package of measures to uh, improve our energy independence and uh, improve our resilience against high international fossil fuel prices. Um, this, inclu this includes looking at improving energy efficiency, um, uh, continuing to use our domestic oil and gas reserves, which we still have, um, but also, and perhaps most importantly, more bold, ambitious targets for the deployment of renewable and low carbon technologies. I think that is the, the most interesting uh, factor within the strategy, that it's actually doubling down on the shift to clean energy um, in support of our net zero strategy. And I just wanted to pick out a few uh, key points here that came out in April. Um, we have boosted our ambition for, for nuclear. So by the end of the decade, we want to see eight reactors progressing for, um, through a series of projects. Um, obviously we have, currently we have Hinkley C, which is um, nearing completion over the next year or two. Um, a total of 24 gigawatts is projected by 2050. So that could be 25% of projected demand. Uh, we want to boost solar capacity um, by simplifying planning processes and uh, making that easier for installation. Uh, and in particular for offshore and onshore wind, we now have an ambition for 50 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, including five gigawatts of floating offshore wind. Um, I mean, this is a significant step up in ambition. Um, hydrogen. We're looking to double our ambition there to have 10 gigawatts of low carbon hydrogen production. Um, and on the fossil fuel side of things, I mean, we, we, we are a net importer, but we still produce uh, oil and gas. We are looking to end our dependence on Russian oil and coal um, by, by the end 22 and on Russian LNG as soon as possible. Um, but in addition, we are developing a climate compatibility checkpoint, which we will use to check the licensing of new fields against longer term climate commitments. So our use of oil and gas, our ongoing production of oil and gas is being carefully checked against our legally binding carbon budgets, which stem back from the 2008 legislation. Um, it's, not, it's also fair to mention that we, are, we have been in negotiation with um, coal generators that were we had uh, several units that were due to close this September ahead of the 2024 deadline. Um, as, a, as an emergency contingency um, measure, we have been in negotiation with those coal units um, to see if they would be available 
should there be a significant disruption to supply. Um, those units were not bidding into the market for this winter and were due to come offline, but given the severity of potential impacts um, uh, around uh, moving from Russian gas in Europe and our links through interconnectors and supply and, and cost implications, that is a contingency measure. But the government still remains firmly committed to then uh, the, the phase out, full phase out in 2024. So this, this piece is really emphasizing the, uh, the fact that the, the implications of these high fossil fuel prices, this volatility on the international market is uh, actually leading to a doubling down of our ambition around low carbon uh, generation measures in support of our net zero commitment. I just wanted briefly to take an international perspective here. And I know the previous speaker mentioned the IEA net zero report and uh, actually the G7 discussions. Um, the UK has had, its journey, it's had its journey over the last 10 years. We have a lot more work to do. We still need to reduce our emissions in the power sector further, and we still need to work uh, ever harder on transport and building emissions in particular. But in the global context, we've recognized that by 2030, we have to have phased out unabated coal in the advanced economies. It, it, it is an imperative ahead of a global phase out by 2040. And as the previous speaker mentioned, the, the aim of net zero emission electricity in advanced economies is something that the UK um, and the G7 has signed up to um, this year. Um, and I think the, the, the G7 commitment this year, which included uh, an explicit recognition of the need to uh, Phase, phase out unabated coal power generation was significant and we need to advance our collaboration and progress to recognizing that unless we as advanced economies move faster in this transition, we cannot uh, support, share and bring, bring with us developing countries who will have a, a, a greater challenge in terms of trying to meet their economic development needs, but also uh, make, make the investments necessary to move to low carbon. Um, as part of that work, uh, we, we placed a great emphasis on uh, the shift from coal power to clean energy as part of our work for COP26. Um, this obviously built on the earlier work of the Power and Pass Coal Alliance, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, and I was really pleased to see the, uh, the reference to Kyoto City and, and their membership of the Alliance. We would be very, very much welcoming further subnational and business uh, members to come and join that alliance and come and share that knowledge, come and share that experience about making the transition. Um, but at Glasgow itself, we use that coalition and our work through the Energy Transition Council, which is explicitly around supporting clean energy development needs for a number of target um, emerging economies. And we had an, a, you know, an 190 strong coalition signed up to show their commitment to ending international coal finance, ending new coal, working to a coal phase out uh, by 2030 and, and 2040 uh, uh, respectively, and also in support of supporting a just transition for those workers that are gonna have to move from the coal sector through to new, um, hopefully attractive jobs within the clean energy sector. Um, and obviously that helped create the political conditions for the uh, inclusion for the first time within the Glasgow Climate Pact, for the first time within the UNFCC, C document, uh, the, the need to globally phase down unabated coal. Um, so I think that sort of shows how the, the UK is trying to take its experience, the, the leadership experience it has, the shift it is undertaking from coal power to renewables and help a much bigger coalition develop and move through that transition together. And I think one of the most interesting things is how we work together not only to drive our own domestic pace of decarbonization, but how we work together with key emerging economies. And uh, the last bullet there references the, the Just Energy Transition Partnerships, which is, I think is a huge opportunity for us as, as, as advanced economies to accelerate and support the transition uh, in economies such as South Africa, Vietnam, Indonesia, or, or India. Um, that's, that's the end of my presentation. Um, I'd be very 
happy to um, answer your questions during the discussion later. Um, so I'll just say, Arigata Gozaimas and Sanara for now. Thank you. Back to you, Ken. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Matthew. So the history of coal was very long in the UK. However, from 2014, you have been dwindling down the coal usage from 40% to 20%. And then even with that, you're also accelerating the reduction of the emission in fast pace, which was so inspiring. So. With the remaining time, we would like to have discussions. I would like to call Okubo-san and Dr. Uh, Matthew Webb, and we're calling also on Takase-san. Uh, please, please show your face. Uh, we would like to have a discussion together as a panel. Thank you very much. From here on, we would like to go on with our discussion and maybe Q&A. So after uh, the two presentation, we would like to discuss based on the two presenters and that's the first portion. And in the second portion, we would like to open the floor for Q&A. From here, we have Takase-san from CDP Worldwide Japan uh, participating. Therefore, the first question goes to her. But within Japanese policy, uh, there was a lot about uh, the hydrogen and ammonia mentioned. And for the hydrogen and ammonia, when we're going to be gaining energy from uh, those two, uh, when it is manufactured, it is going to be emitting CO2, although as an energy, it's not going to be emitting energy. Uh, how so? When the manufacturing base, um, it's still the ammonia and the hydrogen still has the emission. So what is going to be the impact to the um, companies, the private companies? Yes, that's the most biggest focal point and the concerns. I'd like to share my slides with you. So this is my first point to make. The fossil fuel sources is now defined as non-fossil fuel by the government. And whether it be the green ammonia or the brown ammonia, they're both handled in the same way as a non-fossil fuel sources was mentioned by Okubo-san. And as uh, the scope three category, uh, the ammonia and hydrogen when they are used in scope one, it's not going to emit, but as scope three, it is going to be a source of emission. And uh, the derived from a fossil fuel, any electricity that comes from fossil fuel derived hydrogen and ammonia, the scope two, it could be maybe zero. However, in the scope three, it could be falling within the category three, meaning that there is a large emission, substantial one. In the case of Japan, uh, there's a specific reporting system, uh, but in the um, international reporting, uh, there's the SBT and JCI is partnering the zero race to zero, race to zero has a G funds included, which many of the uh, financial institutions are participating. ISSB also uh, says that, again, so SBT and raised to zero, including G funds, are all saying that they include scope three in the scope of corporate responsibility. And raised to zero is expanding largely uh, like uh, the financial institutions, educational institutions, medical institutions, others. And JCI is a multi-stakeholder. So in, this is a scheme that everybody can commit. And for the financial institutions, there's Net Banking Alliance. SBT here is shown on this block and everything The company and the financial institutions are having a request for race to zero. Uh, 
a company has to cover all the scope and a financial institution has to be following all these covered and there's the update of the race to zero of version three uh, version three says that all the companies should be including scope one two three and for financial institutions include their investment and loans so because of the update the biomass uh, it should be handled with care if it needs to be handled for emissions and fossil fuel uh, should be uh, phasing out gradually is what it says the g funds is run for the financial institutions financial institutions various initiatives by 2050 net zero is uh, the target and financial institutions are committed in all these the g funds uh, coming back to this all the requirement is under race to zero uh, therefore it's including the investees and japanese uh, banking companies are included a lot too uh, many large uh, mega banks are included and asset managers are also included asset owners are included insurance alliance are included too and for the investment scope three uh, the investee is in effect including the scope three this is under discussion right now however for the financial institutions spt the scope three if there's a sector when the scope three is very important then scope three will be definitely included now, this is the ifers s2 a climate related disclosure here we have a scope one two three emission which should be disclosed by the uh, companies so what i'd like to say is the in scope three is included in the responsibility range of companies so in 2030 the 20 percent and and have to reduce it by 50 percent but it may result in the uh, value chain that the uh, emission may become larger by using hydrogen or ammonia so so therefore um, in because this would be uh, burned and mixed but so it is not really the countermeasure that is needed for our ambitions and aspirations so so in terms of the ammonia and hydrogen so in the scope three emission when the company is trying to reduce it that is been seen as very important initiatives among companies but then the hydrogen uh, ammonia which originates from the fossil fuel will impact greatly on the emissions i'd like to have a question, another question to websan in the uk the has a long history of use the fossil and the thermal power reduction has been worked on why were you able to achieve such a great reductions because you have the industries that has a long history you need to get a consensus from those industries and to convert from uh, coal to the uh, renewable energy must be quite challenging so what are the key points in your success in reducing those and coal and thermal power generation in the UK? Thank you. Um, there's there, there's a lot there's a, a lot we could point to, but I think um, a couple of the the really fundamental points are the following. Um, I think, firstly when when the time comes to make a transition um there was a clear direction from the government and then quickly followed by innovation from industry which allowed a more smooth transition to happen 
And what I mean by that is particularly with respect to our uh, energy generation mix, uh, there was a point in around 2005, 2010, where the existing infrastructure, our existing coal-fired power plants were reaching the end of their life. And so there was a critical time around 2010 where decisions were either, would either be made to go back to coal, back to carbon, or actually to go to the clean energy direction. And I think that's why in my talk, I emphasize the importance of that government carbon budget document in 2008, which set the, the leadership and the vision, and then that reform of the energy market, which allowed it unleashed the potential, particularly of our offshore winds. Uh, when, it, when offshore wind started, it was costing around 160 to 180 pounds per megawatt hour. Uh, yesterday, the latest renewable auction for offshore wind was 37 pounds per megawatt hour. So clear direction and then clear innovation and work by business and private investment has driven that, that change. But you have to seize that opportunity in the investment cycle, set direction, and then in the early days, incentivize the change. Um, the other thing is just to, you know, just to stress, there is all the, always the potential to transition. You know, our oil and gas and offshore sector specialists are now beginning to turn increasingly to the use of marine engineering, you know, sinking the piles for offshore wind turbines, and now they're starting to think of the use of pipelines for the longer term storage of carbon dioxide. So taking advantage of that industrial base and supporting its transition is, is again, part of the, I, I think why it's been a, uh, an increasingly successful and quite rapid transition uh, for the UK. But they're the, they're the three, they're the probably three main points I'd come back to, I think. Thank you very much. Even if, because the, uh, you know, to, there's the path and the direction was shown clearly uh, from the government, and that has helped the industry to, to do the transformation and the, to work on innovation for the uh, new type of energy. Thank you. So next. Uh, I have a question to Takase-san from the audience. There's a question. Uh, well, just wait, please. In, in the G funds has been mentioned already, in the financial institutions in COP26, was, uh, COP in CDP, in your organizations, that questionnaire was sent. In terms of uh, financial uh, institutions trend, do you know any of the, from the person from CDP, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Well, in CDP, actually, we have uh, that questionnaire has been sent to the financial institution as well. Those listed companies as well as not listed companies, but uh, basically, this is the uh, CDP 2021 uh, uh, summary response from the financial institutions are shown here. And it is the, in the financial service sector, there are 476 companies in 2021. Uh, those are responding companies from the financial service sector. There are 31 companies in Japan who have responded to this questionnaire. And then in case of coal and then that die, die best, the divest the exclusion policy uh, as the divested on the uh, coal or coal related uh, loans. And that was 131 companies, financial institutions globally. And in Japan, there are 14 companies in the three mega banks in Japan, only the Mizuho Financial Group was the only one uh, which is divested in this. Uh, out of 131 companies, however, uh, 131 companies are, and the new ones are only excluded, 60% uh, 
of the financial institutions. So certain percentage, good percentage of them have excluded the existing companies as well from the about the calls and, and some of our. And then, however, in Japan, 13 companies out of 14, uh, sorry, uh, for, uh, sorry for the disturbance, and 13 companies from the 14 companies are only the new companies of the coal or coal related companies are excluded. This is the Mizuho Financial Group response. They have uh, projects for the new uh, general uh, coal mines projects. They will not loan, provide loans, no investment at all. And then based on the party uh, policies, uh, based on the Paris Agreement, the uh, national energy to be supplied in a stable manner and considered, considered and then to, to make the, and in some cases, however, they may do so under some emergency situations in the security aspect. In the CDP questionnaire in 2022, in the, that was deadline that's in July 28th in terms of response. And as you can see here, in the financial services and portfolios, the uh, loans and investment of the uh, coal, the carbon related asset, such as coals and natural gas. And then when they do the investment management and asset that we have made a questionnaire uh, from CDP to those companies. And in G funds, they have the, what about the uh, exclusion policies and so on, where are there some of the discussions? So how are we going to do this and consider this exclusion? And in the platform, and it will be make more these things to be more information to be disclosed. And that is very important. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. In Japan, those financial institutions uh, moves and trends are increasing and also see their questionnaire that those are the emphasize as well and those movement is going to be further accelerated thank you and we actually have a very short time left and therefore i was about to ask okubo san uh, this question is also included from uh, the question from the floor but therefore, with that, I would like to open the floor for a question and answer. And so this is a question to Ms. Okubo. Uh, in Japan, we're now having a tightness of supply and demand for the energy. And for renewable energy, renewable energy cannot be expanded immediately in Japan. Um, how is Japan going to be countering uh, this tightness of supply and demand if the government does not show any way going forward uh, the japanese citizens the public will not be understanding and not be convinced so how should we go on the pathway in order to reduce and to uh, transition make a transition currently again the electricity is in a very tight supply and demand how should we think about other energy source Thank you very much for your question. In the short term, it's an emerging issue that uh, the, the electricity is difficult to secure. And the phasing out is a more longer term issue. So what is immediately happened now is the confusion of the supply and demand it's probably because Japan has not been increasing the renewables in a large way as UK has done in the past. And solar panel is now becoming large in Japan. Therefore, we are able to wade through. The government is asking the public to earnestly ask the public in order to decrease the usage of energy. And during when the sun was out there, it was okay. And when it became evening, the TEPCO was trying to compensate for the energy in order to uh, make the confusion be subsided. However, the solar energy is not working within the nighttime, therefore we must counter on that. 
that relates to the electricity of flexibility that I mentioned, demand and respond by that, the demand of the demand side should be flexibly understood. But when the government asks to the public as earnestly asking them to reduce the energy of energy, that could be reducing the use of energy in the Japanese side. However, uh, to be more scientific, we should be uh, creating a system much more stronger based on demand and response. Uh, the transmission between region and other about the pumping power generation. I think I saw a question regarding pumping power generation too. And currently TEPCO using fossil fuels uh, and uh, combining with the pumping power generation, they're creating energy. Uh, the, in the daytime, they're using solar power. And during uh, the nighttime, uh, we should create a uh, device in order for maybe such as a pumping power generation to keep up with the energy creation in the nighttime too. So we should have much more opportunity for another energy that could be creating power in the nighttime too, like offshore or else maybe the batteries use and if those are combined, we can mitigate the current status today in Japan, I suppose. So not about reopening the nuclear power plant, but taking this opportunity, the government should be thinking of the electricity supply and demand system more flexible and to think about insulation or think about um, energy saving in a much more efficient way. Thank you very much uh, for the offshore uh, energy is pumped up and the pump power generation could be used in the nighttime when the solar power is not used in the daytime. And when we look at storage badly, we understand a lot and we should be improving on demand and response is what Ms. Okubo mentioned. I would like to add what happens when we're going to be phasing out uh, the most problem, the large problem in our country is that we cannot discuss what is going to be happening after the phase out. If we can start discussing, then we will be able to speak and discuss about uh, the pathway for 1.5 degrees. And it's so problematic for me that we are not allowed or open to discuss about the after world of phase out. Uh, two years ago, uh, in 2030, it was announced that even not using the power uh, nuclear power plant, we can achieve uh, the net zero. However, why is it that the policy writes that it's not using the renewables? What I want to mention is that the renewables do have potentiality more. So if I have more time, I would like to discuss on that. Thank you. And we have Dr. Webb. He's coming all the way from UK, so we would like to pose a question to him. And so this is a question that has nine likes. For transition, uh, government's leadership is indispensable. And the coal industry in UK, uh, which is more larger, the uh, public companies or the private companies? And how are you going to be making um, consensus when you're going to be making this Discussions. So, um, so I think now, it, and this is what's what's interesting in in the UK. I think largely for for coal in the UK, the sector is is now very small. So, I think we have around one thousand five hundred jobs in, in, in that sector now. Um, I mean, they are, they are private companies um, and largely, you know, the, the need domestically for coal has fallen dramatically with the reduction in coal power generation. So I think uh, the, you know, the direction of travel for UK coal mining is 
has been quite clear, I think, for the last five or six years. And um, I know that our Welsh government and Scottish governments are looking at change, uh, changes to the planning framework to, uh, you know, to, to tighten restrictions on mining. I think what's more interesting, and I think really live for the UK, is the way in which the government is working with the oil and gas sector. So in some ways, our main uh, concern now is how we bring some of our oil and gas expertise and industry forward um, so that we don't lose skills, we don't lose expertise, we don't lose the ability to uh, use our engineers and, and the oil, oil and gas sector expertise in offshore wind, um, and then moving on into things like carbon capture um, and storage or, or hydrogen facilities. The key thing there has been, you know, there's been a lot of consultation between the government and, uh, and with the North Sea uh, operators. And um, we have, in the, in the last year, we've, we've been consulting uh, with, with the industry groups. We have a specific task force, which is set up to look at how we work together to manage that transition. Um, I, we still have, um, I, am, I can double check these numbers, but it's, it's nearer 150, uh, 150,000 workers in, in that space employed directly. And we are very, very uh, sure that those jobs and skills must move across um, into the clean growth sector. So we have specific task force. There are now specific pieces of funding that the government's putting in place, including through things like clusters and hubs up on the North Sea coast um, to support uh, industrial carbon capture and storage, for example, but also um, you know, direct support for um, some of the projects I mentioned in the talk there, where we've provided backing for things like the facilities at Blythe and government back to help the private sector move into that space. So there's a lot of, um, I, I think, particularly for us now, I think the, the, the coal is largely uh, a transition that's happened. I think the real engagement now for us is, as I said, with particular task force, particular consultations and working with industry to try and uh, bring jobs forward. Um, I would say that my, my, sen my sense is that uh, the, the key companies are really embracing that transition. They're seeing that this is a growing market. They're seeing that group jobs are coming, that they're high quality jobs. So um, I think there is a concern that we maintain skills and that we keep the workforce active and we keep it maintained and we transition it. But I, I'm not sure there's uh, a huge, I'm not sure there's a huge amount of resistance in terms of, uh, you know, looking at those opportunities and moving forward with them. Um, but yeah, the transition is live. Transition from fossils into clean is going to be, you know, happening very quickly, you know, for the different fossil types according to the country context. And we all must, must talk about and share those experiences because it's, it's, it's got to happen more quickly and it's got to happen socially uh, successfully uh, and you know, with, with people seeing the opportunity and feeling the benefit. Otherwise, it will not happen at the speed we need. I hope that helps answer a little bit the question. Thank you very much for your response. In, term, in showing the direction of the policies, those support has been uh, well done in the UK, as I understand. And we are really running out of time now, unfortunately. But for the next question is also to Dr. Webb. Uh, the seven uh, good questions in supporting decarbonizations, uh, power generations, and the, also the output is declined. When output is declined for the power generation and the solar generations, in between, given the fluctuations, uh, what is the uh, current technologies uh, usage to adjust the consumption and demand and supply? And also, what is the future roadmap in adjusting the fluctuation of the demand and supply in, 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 in the UK? Uh, how do you they make the measures to, to take the balance of the demand and supply of those renewable energy. That, so that is, that is a really good question. Um, I will touch on, touch on a few points. Um, 
So at the at the moment, one of the advantages of, of one of the advantages of the UK is that we have quite quite a diverse energy mix. So we are able, uh, particular particularly between particularly between offshore wind and our remaining thermal generators, which are largely gas, um, we are able to do quite a lot of balancing with our installed capacity. So our overall demand has come down. We've been increasing our installed capacity. And because of the diversity, we have, you know, we have some nuclear fleet remaining and new build. We have some gas, which is quite flexible. We have um, offshore wind, which is growing rapidly. And also, um, you know, a not, a, not, a not insignificant amount of solar generation. So at the moment, we have quite a diversity of the mix. Um, Balancing that, the 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 extra the extra factor which is becoming more important is that we now have um, a, a number of interconnector links. We have several inter electrical interconnectors down to France and to Belgium and to the Netherlands and to Norway and to Ireland. So the the key extra dimension that we're able to draw upon um, is also um, to to bring in that interconnected uh, electricity generation. So those those resources and particularly the strength of the offshore and Scottish onshore wind together and the remaining fossil generation put us in a very strong position to balance the, uh, the, the different um, intermittencies. Um, and I think largely one of, the, one of the factors which I certainly find remarkable is that the predictions for what offshore wind could do were largely based on what onshore wind had achieved. And, what I mean by that is that the, the, the availability of offshore wind with the size of the turbines and the location of those turbines further out to sea has meant that that resource has been acting at near a sort of 40 to 50% availability um, rather than what was perhaps ex expected for wind you know, a decade ago, which may have been you know, nearer a third. So the resource is bigger, stronger, and, and there more of the time. And I think that's provided quite a lot of security. Um, that's not to say we've not got to do more. And as I said, the Na National Grid is investing heavily in increasing. Uh, we have developments on demand side management, which are coming in. We have new services that the grid is buying in to maintain inertia. So the spinning stability in the grid, we're buying new services in. And there's also uh, you know, an increasing move towards um, battery storage, um, short-term storage. I think the challenge we're all going to have to address is the, uh, you know, is the long is is the is the longer-term storage facilities that we need. And I think that's the role where further interconnection will be will be of great use. I mean, European resources are very diverse, but longer longer-range interconnectors are now becoming more economic. Um, there are plans for interconnectors for three and 4,000 kilometers being planned. Um, so that's something that we think is critically important where particularly if renewable resources are not so abundant that there's the ability to link to higher generation sources. Um, but the other, the other thing uh, in relation to that is, um, let's say lo long-term storage and interconnection will be quite key in the way that we manage um, the, the the longer term balancing. Um, so there is there is more development to be done, and I guess the other key role is this interest around using hydrogen potentially as another storage buffer, um, to make use of the abundant renewables and then have that longer duration storage. So there is there are some challenges to overcome, but um, as I said, interconnection diversity um, has certainly been. And, and, and I think the, the strength of the offshore wind resources has been largely where we've been able to maintain our stability um, currently. I hope that helps add a little bit of, uh, a little bit of context. Thank you very much. Because you have the diversity uh, parcels and that to be able to intermit, interconnect uh, use uh, to also from in Europe and also interconnection if in Japan when we can develop more interconnection within Japan that also helpful as well in the power supply we need to increase the flexibility of the power supply is very important as we understood from the Dr. Webb's comment thank you 
So now we have now just becomes the 5.30 p.m. Maybe we should have made this webinar and two hours instead, but unfortunately, uh, we have to close this meeting because there are many questions it's still raised. I'm ready to apologize for not being done. So all the questions, but since now it's time to complete, I'd like to, uh, uh, but then I'd like to ask Dr. Webb to make any message to Japan or any aspirations. Uh, if you could give us a last message, please, Dr. Webb to Japan. Uh, it, well, it's very kind of you to uh, to offer me that chance. I, all, all I would say is, um, you know, uh, the, the UK and Japan uh, have have always worked very closely together, uh, strong cooperation and collaboration. And I think that's something we are you know, very keen to uh, continue. I think two, two island nations, uh, huge potential to show leadership and to make a rapid transition. So uh, but very happy to continue that work together. And I think, you know, we hope, hopefully we can share that, share that leadership journey over the next decade, both in our own economies. But also I, I think we've got great opportunities to work together, particularly in, in our collaboration with other countries over the next few years. And I, I, I know I mentioned in my talk, uh, interactions with countries like Vietnam and Indonesia on their energy transition. And I think there's a huge opportunity for us to join forces and actually um, accelerate um, the global progress that we need to see um, after Glasgow or COP26 and, you know, using, you know, using some of the change that's been pushed upon us by the, uh, you know, the global energy crisis that we're in, there is huge opportunity to actually reduce our vulnerability and drive forward um, the clean energy solutions we need. So uh, really look forward to further collaboration and, 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 and thank you so much for the opportunity to come and uh, spend some time with you at the seminar. It's been a, a fantastic pleasure. Uh, arigato gozaimasu. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much. And I think it is a good opportunity to continue our collaboration between Japan and the UK. And we'd like to know further more about the status in the UK as well. I'd like to appreciate the other speakers as well. And also I'd like to appreciate the participants to ask us a lot of questions. And with that, I would like to conclude uh, today's event seminar. And we will be further introducing our webinar in, about our activities of Japan Climate Initiative. Thank you very much for attendance. This concludes the conference. Thank you.